after excellent uh, shortly after finding my first sand wasps and you can see those uh on the right uh next to me i like to think that entomologists resemble their study organism a little bit uh you can be the the judge of that yourself so in this first section of the talk uh, i like to call this solitary wasps uh, the other hymenoptera hymenoptera being bees wasps and ants of course so not this uh, kind of wasp which would be a social wasp our friends or at least i like to think they're friends uh, the yellow jackets and hornets not something like this which would be a parasitic wasp and certainly not something like this which would be a, a lovely ant but something like this a, a solitary wasp this uh, one is a cicada killer a very large and commonly seen species you may have seen some uh, you may have had people report some to you uh, under the mistaken impression that they're murder hornets these are quite harmless i assure you so solitary wasps belong to the aculeate hymenoptera uh, meaning that they're sting bearing there's over 20,000 species uh, both in the apoid and vespoid groups and they have an enormous diversity of form and lifestyle so uh, the major uh, thing that they do uh, is make their nests. So that's why they're called solitary wasps because they nest individually. They're not forming these social groups uh, like the yellow jackets and hornets do. And they have a, a very uh, large number of different ways that they can make these nests. Some excavate them into the soil, some build them up. Uh, for instance, uh, potter wasps uh, build them out of mud. These beautiful pots uh, which end up storing caterpillars or they occupy and modify existing uh, holes and crevices hollow twigs nests of other wasps so there's really a tremendous number of uh, different life histories and different strategies that these wasps can carry out and even though they're solitary so there's no cooperation they're not nesting together directly they do sometimes occur in high densities they may like the same habitat so they may all be nesting in the same place but they're not nesting cooperatively which is the distinction between them and the social wasps we'll see if this works i never want to count on uh youtube videos actually working when you need them Okay, there we go. So here you can see some wasps that are moving around their nesting site. So you can see that even though that these are solitary wasps and each of these has their own individual nest under the soil, these would be uh, the females, they are all occurring together. They do interact. We can see them here uh, bumping around and having a good old wasp time. So this sort of gives you a sense of what uh, a solitary wasp habitat might be like. So they're certainly not few and far between, even though they are solitary. So this is a, another video of these wasps. So here we can see that they really are interacting quite a bit. These are some sand wasps which are fighting over a prey item. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that later on. But so they are interacting. They are, uh, in this case, they're not cooperating. They're getting in each other's way. But solitary doesn't necessarily mean that they're acting in isolation. And I just love to, to watch these at work. So when it comes to what they're doing with these nests, uh, each nest uh, is built for the purpose of raising the next generation. So it's the females who are building these nests and they're provisioning them uh, usually with paralyzed prey. There are some oddballs that may have a a vegetarian diet but for the most part they're stocking these with prey items and the larvae consume these provisions uh, their own stockpile of provisions until they're ready to mature there are a couple of different kinds of provisioning based on the the speed at which it's done one type is mass provisioning or all at once in which the female takes all of the food that the larva is going to need for its development uh, stuffs it all into the nest seals the nest up and never returns the prey item will remain fresh because it's not killed uh, it's simply paralyzed so it's a bit grim but it remains alive uh, in up until the point where the wasp larva is ready to eat it and the wasp larvae are very good at eating the essential parts last so the food remains fresher for longer i think it's all terribly interesting but it's uh it's not terribly kind 
The other kind of provisioning is progressive provisioning. And in this kind, the female wasp only brings in a little bit of prey items at a time and continues to monitor the growth of the larva uh, based on its size to determine how long food needs to be provided and how much food needs to be provided. Once she assesses that the larva is just about ready to mature, she'll seal off the nest and only then start a new one. So there's actually uh, quite a, a bit of complex behaviors going on uh, with this provisioning. It's not just uh, eating. And they do have a, a bit of host specificity. So different kinds of solitary wasps will only attack certain kinds of prey. So in this case, uh, a Bembix wasp, uh, one of those lovely sand wasps, they are diptera specialists. They attack flies. So they won't attack other kinds of insects for the most part. But within that restriction, they're fairly unrestricted in terms of what they like. So they'll attack any fly of the appropriate size and body shape. So flesh flies, low flies, horse flies, as long as it's a uh, large and fly-like, they're happy to attack it. So it's not quite like a, a parasitic insect, some of which have very, very particular uh, taste in hosts. So for this reason, they sort of have a mixed uh, life strategy. So like a predatory wasp, like a yellow jacket, they attack uh, prey items and, well, they don't feed on them directly, but their larvae do. But like a parasitoid, they only attack uh, particular kinds of prey. And because they sort of exhibit this hybrid lifestyle between predatory and parasitoid, the term predatoid has been suggested as a uh, name for the kinds of behaviors that these wasps exhibit. Unfortunately, uh, I think anyway, this term hasn't really caught on, possibly because it's a, a little bit of a mouthful. I think it sounds really cool. So these wasps are more typically called uh, just solitary wasps. And they tend to get less attention than other kinds of wasps. Social wasps are, of course, very uh, dramatically visible in our daily lives. Yellow jackets uh, around the eaves of our homes and whatnot. Uh, the famous murder hornet incident of a few years back. And parasitic wasps are very important in biological control and protecting agriculture. So those tend to get the bulk of the attention. But I think that solitary wasps, uh, sort of the unsung heroes of the wasp world deserve more attention because there's a lot of really cool things that they do and a lot of really cool things that they can teach us. So there's, like I said, over 20,000 different species of solitary wasps. and I can only discuss so much in one talk. So the, and I can really only study so much in one lifetime. Uh, but the group that I have devoted my research to are, as I've mentioned previously in this talk, uh, the sand wasps, uh, that's the genus Bembix, not to be confused with several other groups of wasps uh, called sand wasps. Unfortunately, there is no specific common name just for Bembix. But Bembix has about 330 species distributed across the world. Uh, which is unusual. Uh, the rest of their tribe, that taxonomic group, is found only in North and South America. So it's very unusual that Bembix is spread out, not just across that region, but across the entire world, except really for Hawaii, unfortunately. Uh, but their greatest uh, species richness occurs in Australia and in Africa, where there are about 70-odd uh, species each. So a tremendous amount of diversity. And as the name implies, uh, these are specialists in sandy soils. Uh, so they like all sorts of uh, sand. Some of them are beachfront nesters. Some of them are sand dune nesters. There's even a species that likes sand compacted to a particular point that it matches uh, just about what you would find uh, at the outfield of a baseball diamond. So they're particularly characteristic there, which is uh, a bit fun. So I've had good luck with these YouTube videos so far. I'll play one more. So this is uh, the common uh, North American species, Bembix americana. This is a, a female digging into her nest. So you can see that she's really good at digging through the soil. She has these uh, rake combs on her front legs. She uses those to sweep sand behind her and she's getting dive bombed by another solitary wasp. So I'll play that one more time. You can uh, actually not quite see her nest in this video. It's not that she hasn't dug it yet, it's that she's actually uh, concealed it with a plug of sand at the top. So this helps keep it uh, concealed from predators and parasites while she's away. So right now she's digging into that nest. 
So the basic Bembix uh, life history, and you can see in the photo behind my text what an open nest looks like, uh, is that they dig a tubular nest burrow extending variable length uh, up to about 45 centimeters down uh, into sandy soils, terminating in one or more ovular nest cells. Each cell contains a single egg and a large mass of paralyzed flies. These are diptera specialists. Uh, for the larva to eat. They're progressive provisioners, so they will be assessing the larval development and bringing in flies each day, and they tend to be active uh, during sunny periods. The interesting thing about Bembex is that all of these uh, life history things, which I just said, all the 330 species do, there are actually exceptions to each and every one of these things. So it turns out that Bembex, despite having a in the broad sense, a very similar life history throughout the world actually has a tremendous amount of diversity to that behavior as well. For instance, there are additional nest structures that can be added onto this simple burrow, including to name just a few, back burrows, back furrows, inner and outer closures, nest spurs, as well as differences in the way and the timing that these nests are constructed, even though their overall basic structure is the same. There's also differences in the way and the manner in which they provision their nests, so almost all Bembex are diptera specialists, but some of them prey on things that are totally unlike from flies, lace wings, other wasps, even damsel flies, which are extremely different. And some of them uh, have gone from progressive provisioning to that mass provisioning. There are even species that have sort of eschewed uh, being active during the day and have chosen to be active at dawn and dusk instead. So all of this diversity going on, which makes all of the 330 species, or at least the ones that we've studied, all of them have a nesting biology which is unique in some way. And based on that, it's a pretty safe uh, bet that the species we haven't studied will also prove to be unique in their own ways as well. But the interesting thing is that when it comes to their morphology, uh, the way that they look, they tend to be quite compact. So they all sort of look like that. They have somewhat of a variation in pattern, but it all pretty much uh, looks like a Bembex. Most variation uh, is in males, in male-only characters, not just the genitalia, but modifications to the legs uh, and the abdomen that are only found in males. And females are distinguished primarily uh, by color and pattern because they lack these structures. So it's more difficult to distinguish the, the females from the males or the females from each other than the males from each other. But really across the genus, we seem not to be dealing with a tremendous amount of morphological diversity. So as a fresh-faced graduate student, uh, being really excited to look on Bembex, uh, I saw this as an opportunity. Uh, there was no phylogeny, no evolutionary tree that existed for the group, even though the group was fairly large. And there were excellent publications on both behavior and taxonomy, as well as excellent uh, collections especially of uh, North American Bembex uh, at the AMNH, uh, where I was doing my graduate work, as well as uh, other institutions. So during uh, the work I'm discussing here, uh, my graduate work, which is a little while ago at this point, I had a couple of goals. Uh, the first was to build the first phylogeny for Bembex. Uh, the second was to figure out how that diversity of behavior evolved and why it was so diverse. So the first thing I did uh, was to try to build an evolutionary tree based on those behaviors as the characters uh, with which we would try to detect evolutionary signal. What morphology would be uh, the more traditional route, but I was really interested in these behaviors. And because I had read so much about how the behavior was really diverse and the morphology wasn't, I wanted to see if we could get evolutionary signal and behavior and maybe signal that wouldn't exist uh, in the morphology. So I went into the literature and I built a character set of 20 characters for 34 species, which is about 10% of the uh, generic diversity. And these characters were largely nesting and provisioning behaviors because this is where most of the uh, diversity is and it's really uh, most of what Bembix do. So 10% of the diversity was a uh, less than the amount that has been studied in the field, but I decided to exclude species where we only had partial or fragmentary notes on the behaviors and really go for the species that had been comprehensively studied. And 10% of the generic diversity being very well studied behaviorally is, I think, pretty good. It's one of the reasons I chose to work on Bembix in the first place. 
So I built that evolutionary trait and ran it in a parsimony framework. And I got uh, the first evolutionary trait, as far as I'm aware, for Bembex, which was very exciting. But unfortunately, uh, you can see that this tree is not completely resolved. There's a, a lot of points where it doesn't actually branch and you have a, a large polytomy. So this wasn't necessarily all that useful for determining evolution uh, within the group. I was a little ambitious uh, with my enthusiasm for behavior. There's a couple of reasons uh, that this uh, phylogeny may not have been as uh, complete as I would have liked. Part of that is that the taxon selection was necessarily uh, small and somewhat uneven. Uh, it wasn't really based on geographic uh, areas or based on uh, taxonomic groupings. It was based on just what the behavioral uh, literature was. I also discovered that behavior varied significantly, not just between species, but within species as well, which sort of tends to obscure the signals. And some of these behavioral characters could get quite complex as a result. For instance, uh, this character that I'm displaying here is based on whether the nest has an interior plug of soil that blocks off the nest cell from the rest of the, uh, the nest. And that isn't just a, a presence or absence character. Sometimes it's present only when the larva is small and then it's absent uh, when the larva gets larger. Uh, sometimes it's absent when or present when the larva is small and then later absent only when the wasp is provisioning. When she's sealing off the nest for the night, then the inner closure happens. And these states are not just distributed between species, but also within species as well. So you might have individuals in the same population where some of them never build an inner closure and some of them always do. And some of them sort of vary like that. And all of this uh, was sort of working to conceal evolutionary signal and behavior. So then I had to, or I chose to, go for morphology next. And I remembered the first thing I'd heard uh, about the morphology of these wasps uh, from Howard Ensign Evans, who really did a tremendous amount of work on Bembex and whose uh, behavioral work paved the way for everything I did. And he had noted that the genus was compact and not really divisible into defined species groups on the basis of morphology. But doing some further uh, reading on Bembex, in a, another book, uh, Bohart and Menke, which uh, is also called the, the Big Blue Book of Sphesid Wasps, a hugely fun volume if you're into solitary wasps like I am, of Bembex, they said, there is such diversity in structure that it is difficult to characterize the genus. So this was a, a little confusing. You obviously uh, can't seem to have a genus which lacks morphological diversity and is wildly morphologically diverse at the same time. So if you look in the broad sense, uh, like those two wasps I just showed you, they all sort of have that body plan. They all sort of have that coloration. But if you look at the finer details, you can start to see where some of that bewildering morphological diversity arises. These are some images of the abdominal sternites uh, of male Bembex, where they have these projections that really have this uh, fantastic diversity of form. They have these uh, sort of a sharp prong uh, in the upper right, big hook coming off of it uh, beneath that, these sort of uh, flattened double prong structures, and some like this entirely. So looking at these characters, I could start to see where some of this morphological diversity was coming from. And it seems like Bembic sort of has a, a two-tiered uh, sort of uh, definition of their morphological diversity. In the broad sense, their morphology and coloration is extremely similar. But in the smaller scale, looking at particular structures, there they have a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of their abdomens, modifications to their ocelli, the labrum, femora, all sorts of things going on. So from this, I was pretty confident I could build a morphological tree. And I also thought it was very interesting that behavior seemed to mirror morphology. So it's the same sort of pattern of diversity where in the broad sense, all Bembics are sort of doing the same thing and they all sort of look the same. But in the finer sense, there you get to see a lot of the differences between groups arise. And taxonomically speaking, it is useful for defining species groups that take uh, certain uh, species and sort of lump them together, uh, but you can't really use either behavior or morphology to figure out how these groups are related to each other, uh, at least in the uh, taxonomically speaking. 
It was also interesting uh, because most of this morphological diversity was in male-only characters. So where males are morphologically diverse and behaviorally compact, females were behaviorally diverse and morphologically compact. So all of this was sort of swirling around in my head as I was thinking happily of sand wasps. And so I decided to build a morphological phylogeny uh, which would hopefully succeed where the behavioral phylogeny uh, had been lacking. And I was certainly able to include a lot more uh, of the group's diversity because uh, I could look at the specimens myself and gathering specimens from museums and building this tree was a, a lot easier than uh, getting the chance to go out into the field and observe uh, dozens of species. Although if anyone has uh, a lot of money kicking around and they want to fund somebody to go look at sand wasps in the field, please let me know. Uh, but for the morphological phylogeny, I was able to build uh, a tree for 114 species, uh, representing 51 out of the 54 species groups, uh, which had been proposed for species around the world, as well as some species uh, that had not been grouped. So this was relatively even in terms of its geographic coverage. The data set included 63 total characters, of which just over uh, just over half, uh, 37, were found only in males, and the rest uh, were found in both sexes. Some of these characters uh, started to get really diverse. Uh, this is where that uh, bewildering morphological diversity sets in. So here you can see the actual character states that I painstakingly wrote for those abdominal prongs, and there are uh, eight different uh, forms that it can have. And this was just for a third of the group species. There would probably be a couple more states if I could take a look at all of them. But I was able to go through and run an evolutionary tree based on that data set. And this turns out something uh, which is much better resolved. So that was exciting. Uh, the difficult part was that uh, putting that under resampling, which was testing how reliable the best tree was, how confident I could be in any of those groups. Uh, a lot of that uh, tree structure uh, collapsed. So there was signal in morphology, but it wasn't necessarily terribly strong. Uh, the interesting thing was that some of the groups that we did recover uh, moderate with moderate support matched the species groups that had been proposed by taxonomic literature. Uh, above and below those groups, there was fairly weak support which concurs with what had been said about morphology in the taxonomic sense, that it was useful for building these groups of species, but <sighs> figuring out how the species in those groups were related to each other or how the groups were related to each other, not so much, which was a little bit disappointing, uh, but it was good to see that the evolutionary analysis, the phylogenetic work was concurring with what had been done on taxonomy. So I was sort of comparing the behavioral and the morphological trees. Uh, the morphological tree, as I said, was much better resolved than the behavioral tree. The interesting thing was that the behavioral trees uh, relationships and the morphological trees relationships were not necessarily congruent. So they were saying different things about the evolution of the group, even though the general pattern uh, in their broad similarities and uh, more finer scale changes uh, was fairly similar. The actual evolutionary signal in these data sets did not appear to be all that similar. So neither source in the end was entirely satisfactory. Uh, for behavior, it was likely because there was so much intraspecific diversity. And for morphology, it was probably because uh, there were certain parts of the data where there was a ton of diversity, which maybe doesn't actually say too much about how broadly different species are related to each other. And then you have some parts of the data set which are very compact and can't really be used to untangle those relationships. So with morphology and behavior uh, being tested out, uh, I finally turned to molecular data. So I went for uh, DNA at last. So I extracted DNA from museum specimens of Bembex wasps. Uh, the average age of those wasps was about 40 years. Uh, the youngest was about uh, 14. The oldest I attempted to get data at was almost 100 years old. And you can, uh, with an ultra-conserved elements approach, uh, which uses small regions of the genome which remain conserved over long periods of time, uh, extract, the, uh, extract yeah. DNA from uh, museum specimens. 
And the nice thing about uh, ultra-conserved elements is that they are extremely small regions of the <laughs> genome, uh, which means that even when DNA is fragmented, as it happens when you leave uh, a museum specimen uh, to dry in a drawer for 40 years, you can still recover those. And they tend to border regions of the genome which are more rapidly changing. So you can use those to infer evolutionary relationships. So I attempted to extract data from about uh, 70 odd species of sand wasps and was able to get successful uh, data from about 28 of them. Uh, when you're working with museum specimens, uh, it's great to get the DNA that you can, but certainly not every specimen uh, will be successful in returning workable DNA. Oftentimes it's for uh, reasons of specimen conditions that are totally unknowable to you before you try, so you have to take what you can get. And using that uh, genetic data, I returned this, uh, the third ever evolutionary tree for sand wasps, as far as I'm aware. And this was uh, both uh, well-structured and uh, much better supported compared to the morphological tree. So this was really uh, the first uh, reliable way for me to take a look at sand wasp relationships. So there's a couple of uh, different parts of the tree uh, that I'd like to pay closer attention to. Uh, I won't go over the whole thing in detail, even though I do love to talk about sand wasps. Uh, one thing is that the Belfragii group, uh, one of those taxonomic species groups, uh, was largely recovered in this uh, molecular tree. And this is a, a very interesting group of Bembex for a couple of reasons. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Speaking of regions, it's distributed uh, from the USA down to Baja, California. And morphologically and behaviorally, they're fairly unusual for Bembex. Uh, so they are among the crepuscular species of Bembex, meaning that they're active uh, at dawn and dusk as opposed to the daylight hours that other Bembex wasps are active in. And they have a number of uh, unusual modifications to the mouth parts and wing venation, as well as uh, an absence of the modifications of the abdomen, which are so common in other species of Bembex. Some of these characters, although unusual for Bembex, are common in other groups of closely related wasps. And for this reason, Bembex has been proposed for quite some time as the most basal group in the Bembex evolutionary tree, which uh, my analysis uh, did support. So you can see coming out at the base of the tree, uh, you have uh, part of that Belfragii group. And as a result, uh, the Belfragii group is likely very important for understanding Bembix's evolution because it is uh, it does appear to be the most basal group and the most similar to what the ancestral Bembix might have been like. There's also a, a lot that needs to be done in the Belfragii group in terms of uh, its taxonomic diversity. There's a lot of unrecognized diversity uh, in this group. The females are nearly identical to each other, and the males are very easily distinguished from other kinds of Bembex because of their unusual modifications, but they're much more difficult to distinguish from each other. And people have a tendency to see one of these Belfragii group species and sort of put it in a drawer as one of the more common species because it's so recognizable, but it could uh, very well be a rarer species uh, or even uh, an undescribed species. There's uh, some stuff I should really get around to publishing. Uh, the interesting thing is that a lot of these species live nearly sympatrically. So even though they're distinct species, uh, they live pretty much uh, on top of each other because they all have their very own particular uh, soil microhabitats that they like. So you might have a single sand dune hosting multiple species of Bembix, all of which nest only in different parts of the dune. So even though an entomologist who comes in there with a net and starts grabbing things might collect them all at the same time, they're actually not overlapping in terms of their environment all that much. And so there's a, a lot that needs to be done for this group. In particular, uh, this one species is very interesting, uh, Bembix magdalene. Uh, which is found only in the Magdalena Bay of Baja California. Uh, it has a totally unique uh, morphology for Bembex in that its last uh, abdominal uh, tergite is a, a three-pronged sort of trident-like structure, uh, which is common in the close theory related genus Rubrica, but as far as I'm aware, is completely uh, unique in Bembex. So this would be a very interesting group for understanding the a very interesting species for understanding the evolution of the group. Uh, unfortunately, it's only been collected once uh, in 1926. 12 specimens are known, uh, has never been seen again. 
uh, could possibly be extinct? Uh, hopefully not. And so uh, another thing which is uh, interesting to take a look at for this part of the evolutionary tree is that you can see that the uh, geographic areas in which these uh, species are found does not necessarily correspond to their closest uh, evolutionary relationships. So we have the uh, the North American species in red, and I just realized I was trying to point to that with a, a mouse cursor, I'm not sure you can see. Uh, but you can see that the North American species are in red, but do not necessarily form one monophyletic group. So there does appear to be uh, quite a bit of uh, biogeographic spread across the world, and some of the uh, Palearctic species are more closely related to certain groups of North American uh, Bembex than those North American Bembex are to each other. So a particularly uh, interesting uh, species uh, or species group for understanding the uh, spread and diversification of Bembex, remember Bembex has gotten out and somehow colonized the world, whereas all of its close relatives have not, are uh, Bembex cinerea and Bembex hyenae. Uh, which are very rare species restricted to narrow strips of coastal habitat uh, along the East Coast, so uh, about New Jersey all the way down to Florida. Uh, so they are uh, saline species, so they actually nest in uh, coastal areas uh, where the tide comes in and actually washes over their nests, which is a very unusual habitat, not just for Bembix, but really for almost any insect. And it's been observed that where these species are found, they're often the only insects that are actually living there. So they're morphologically distinct as well, in addition to uh, bio, uh, habitat wise from other North American species. And the genetic analysis indicates that this species is nested within a clade which is otherwise European. So this would be a very uh, interesting species for understanding how Bembix uh, spread across the world. It's very, uh, compelling to think about a species of Bembix which is nesting uh, next to uh, the ocean for how they might uh, spread. And it, it seems as if these coastal habitats could be important to dispersal and overall speciation, uh, as you can see uh, from the California's Channel Islands, where the common species of Bembix, Bembix americana, is found, but each island actually has a distinct subspecies, uh, which has made it to that island and uh, begun to diversify there and uh, split apart from its neighbors on the closest island. So that really suggests something about how Bembix might be jumping across the world. But I'll uh, speak no more on that for the moment because islands are actually a great jump to the next part of my uh, talk on a very different kind of underground insect. Uh, so going back to Hawaii for a moment, which may be welcomed uh, on this snowy evening. The second part of my talk is definitely not uh, focused on the snowy part of nature. Uh, this part is called life in the lava tubes. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about Hawaiian cave arthropods. So some of you may know about a cave dwelling uh, life found here on the mainland, as it's often called in, here in Hawaii, where you might find uh, unusual cave spiders and beetles I had a, a very influential uh, encounter in my younger days with a uh, giant cave cockroaches. I've never forgotten that one. But these uh, sort of cave adapted arthropods can be found uh, in limestone caves throughout the mainland. But they were not expected to be found in Hawaii because Hawaii's caves are very different from the limestone caves which host cave life on the mainland. Uh, lava tubes are very young in a geographic sense. They're far older than us, but they're much younger than limestone caves. Additionally, typical cave resources that feed these uh, cave animals are unavailable in Hawaiian caves. Uh, a lot of uh, what feeds uh, limestone cave life, a uh, bat guano, uh, but Hawaii has only one species of bat and it's uh, not a cave nester, so that food source is not available. Uh, or nutrients which are brought in from water streams which flow in from the surface but Hawaiian lava tubes can't have flowing water because they're much more fragile than a, a limestone cave. So if water flows through them for very long, the cave just collapses. So uh, a cave with water in it in Hawaii wouldn't last long enough to begin uh, hosting cave life. Additionally, the typical ancestors of cave species are not present in Hawaii. And you can sort of see why that would be the case because 
the kind of animal which would be well adapted to go underground into a cave and evolve uh, cave habitat living and never leave is not very well adapted to go across the ocean and to reach an island. So for all of those reasons, even though uh, Hawaii's lava tubes were very well uh, recognized, it was not thought that there would be cave life in Hawaii. But in 1971, uh, scientists at the Bishop Museum, uh, where I was working when I was involved in the, this research, decided that they were going to look in these lava tubes for cave life uh, just to see. And so in Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park, uh, a researcher named Frank Howarth discovered the first known Hawaiian cave life, a plant hopper and a cricket. So we have uh, some photographs of those here, and you can see that these do look like uh, cave adapted organisms of the type you might find on the mainland. They've lost their color because there's not much point to having uh, pigment in areas where there's no light. Their eyes are reduced. Uh, so they have this uh, typical pale sort of blind cave life adaptations where we weren't supposed to see any forms of life like this. And so the question is, how are these things uh, existing in these environments which are seemingly so unsuitable uh, for cave life? And the answer comes in uh, the form of a plant, which is very important to Hawaii, both culturally and uh, ecologically, which is the ohia tree, which is one of the first plants which will recolonize lava flows, the same lava flows that are forming these tubes underground. And when these plants are growing on top of the lava flows, their roots are growing down into these lava tubes. And that forms a food source for plant hoppers to feed on. And so once you have plant hoppers in the caves, they stick around, they start to evolve to become adapted to the cave life. And then the plant hoppers, as well as the uh, droppings in the bodies that they leave behind, uh, become food for other organisms which may enter into these caves as well. So this was forming a, a cave ecosystem that was totally unsuspected. And so over 50 years of surveys in these areas and over 60 lava tubes, after these initial two species were found, over 45 species of cave adapted life have been found in Hawaii, which was really a, a tremendous uh, discovery and really changed uh, everything that was known about how cave life adapted and evolved because it happened someplace it wasn't supposed to and it happened much faster than it was expected to occur because Hawaiian lava tubes had been around for such a short period of time. So there really is a fantastic amount of diversity in these Hawaiian caves. Uh, there are millipedes, plant hoppers, assassin bugs, isopods, beetles, and these specimens which were collected uh, formed uh, the basis for the Bishop Museum's uh, cave arthropod collection, uh, also known as the HCAC for Hawaiian cave arthropod collection. Uh, over 40,000 specimen lots of cave life, mostly collected uh, in lava tubes on Hawaii's islands, also found uh, in some specimens from similar environments uh, in other areas. Uh, and it's, of course, uh, the founding and the largest collection of cave life in Hawaii, including many uh, rare and officially uh, federally endangered species. Much of this material uh, is likely irreplaceable uh, because these cave environments are so fragile. Uh, they're very vulnerable to uh, ecological change and human activity. And they do have a tendency to collapse if disturbed. In fact, unfortunately, right before the research trip uh, that discovered that first plant hopper and cricket, uh, the largest Hawaiian lava tubes uh, in that area uh, were collapsed by agricultural work. And whatever species may have been found in those lava tubes uh, were lost forever. And so the discoveries that were made, as influential as they were, were actually found in some of the smaller uh, lava tubes in the area. But we still have found uh, some really fantastic things in Hawaii. Uh, this is a particularly uh, interesting one, uh, Howarth's cave wolf spider, uh, Lycosa Howarthi. So this is a, a little-eyed, big-eyed spider is the other common name for it. Uh, which seems like a bit of an oxymoron. It belongs to uh, the wolf spiders, which are also called big-eyed spiders because they have these really uh, fantastically large eyes, which they use as visual hunters. But as it turns out, in a lava tube where it's entirely dark, unless a, a scientist is lighting you up with a headlamp, it doesn't really help to have large eyes. And in fact, it takes a lot of energy to maintain them, especially when you've got eight. So they've evolved to have their eyes shrunk down dramatically 
uh, and they hunt uh, using uh, vibrational cues instead. There is also uh, a no-eyed big-eyed spider, which has lost its eyes entirely. Uh, this is uh, one of the species that's on the federally endangered list. Uh, surveys estimate that there may be about 100 of these uh, living uh, in Hawaii uh, at any given time, uh, which is not a, a lot of, uh, of a population to maintain a species. So in addition to being fantastically bizarre, these are also really precious species in an ecological sense. Uh, this is another uh, species found, not an insect or a spider, but an amphipod, uh, which feeds on sort of biological slimes and debris found in these lava tubes, which is another food source. You don't have bats producing uh, guano droppings, but you do still have other uh, arthropods producing droppings and bacteria sort of growing these mass. And that's what these amphipods feed on, and they become uh, the food source themselves for some of those spiders. So we have these uh, fantastic Hawaiian lava tubes, as well as the collection, which is uh, sort of serving as that permanent biological record of these lava tubes. Uh, when I was at Bishop Museum in Hawaii, we were working on recurating and digitizing this collection. Uh, there are some challenges facing the collection. Uh, part of it is that there's been a long pause in active curation of this uh, collection due to retirements and the like. So if you've worked with alcohol specimens before, uh, and these specimens do need to be kept in alcohol because cave specimens tend to be uh, more fragile, so you can't uh, store most of them pinned and dried. They have to be in ethanol, uh, but ethanol tends to evaporate over time. Uh, there's also uh, identification and organization needing updating because there's been fantastic bursts of collecting all sorts of uh, unusual things in Hawaiian lava tubes. And now these things are awaiting either identification or in many cases, uh, description uh, so that they can finally be known to science. We also uh, don't have a centralized inventory of the holdings. Uh, many of these specimens have gone out on loan across the world. Uh, they're not just of interest to people studying Hawaii, but they're of fantastic interest to people studying cave life in general because they're such an unusual part of cave history. And they've been uh, quite influential uh, in uh, the world of biospelology, uh, cave life. In Australia, actually, uh, there were people who read the original publications on Hawaiian cave plant hoppers. And having similar environments in Australia, they were inspired to go look for plant hoppers in their own caves. As it turns out, they found them there too, where they may not have been discovered for a long time had it not been for the Hawaiian work. So this is not just a collection uh, found in Hawaii, but a collection really of worldwide relevance, which is why we were interested in digitizing it, taking photographs of all of the specimens and their labels, and getting this into a, a fully uh, digitized online collection uh, as part of a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, to get all of this online, not just the specimens themselves, but also the original field notes, including details about the cave environments and maps of them, really fantastic information to get this world-class collection uh, into shape. So that those were our major goals, to establish the collection as a cataloged resource, secure specimen condition, and establish the first uh, full checklist of Hawaiian cave biota. So uh, I, this is something I worked on for two years in Hawaii, is still continuing. Uh, during that time, we were able to centralize all of these specimens into one place, uh, take all of the field notes, and uh, get all of the specimen tubes imaged and all of the field notes imaged as well. So the field notes in particular are really fantastic. They cover most of the collection and have the critical environmental context, which is so important for understanding these cave specimens because uh, the, these cave environments can be very small and very far apart from each other. So they can have really unique faunas, for, especially from island to island. So this information is really critical. There are uh, some serious challenges, just even to, to working just with the specimens themselves. Uh, so the cave environments are highly sensitive uh, and some of them may collapse if uh, overused. These populations of species tend to be extremely small and the lands themselves may be federally, be federally protected or on private lands where landowners may not necessarily want uh, these 
caves being known, they don't want people to trespass into them. And as scientists, we don't want people to do that uh, willy-nilly either. And this had significant consequences for data generation and management for the Hawaiian Cave Arthropod Collection. So one of the, the great things uh, that uh, people like to do for digitizing collections is to crowdsource it to put uh, these specimen uh, labels and field notes online and to let interested members of the public uh, do some of the typing and transcription to assist with that. Uh, but when these labels may contain uh, sensitive information, we can't put them online. And that is something that has uh, limited the speed of the project because the data needs to be scrubbed on a, a large scale to figure out not just what can be uh, crowdsourced or transcription, but even what can be put online when the whole collection is digitized, what needs to be uh, sort of uh, removed to protect these environments. But the collection as a whole uh, really demonstrates uh, the importance of cave environments, not just for Hawaii, uh, but for the, the world as a whole. And this is a, a really fantastic collection that I was privileged to work on and to do some uh, outreach and some teaching as well uh, for the Hawaiian education system, which sort of, I think, uh, brings me to the overall basis of my talk, which theoretically the, uh, the theming was arthropods living underground, which was sort of also cool things I've done. But the, the broad thing I really want people to consider is how much uh, cool stuff uh, is lurking underground, whether that be uh, under a, a beach or a baseball diamond or inside of a lava tube. All these fantastic insects that aren't just uh, existing and are cool to collect and put in a museum, uh, but all of their interesting behaviors and the things that they can tell us that are relevant across the world. So spiders pulled out of a cave in Hawaii can be really important to understanding environments in Australia. And one of the things that I was really hopeful for and still am as a sand wasp researcher is that understanding how the evolution of behavior has occurred in sand wasps can be used as a model for understanding how behavior evolves and diversifies overall. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff that's going on. So pay attention underneath your feet and pay attention to solitary wasps, not just the big, cool, and scary social ones is sort of the, the overarching theme that I've got. So thank you everyone for listening to my talk tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Very nice. Thank you, Jeremy, for this wonderful talk. Uh, very interesting. The um, diversity that uh, occurs in the lava tubes. Um, there was something I wanted to ask previously, and now it escaped my mind. But I'll, I'll defer. If anyone else has some questions to ask, maybe I'll, I can remember what it was I wanted to ask you. Let's see, something's in the chat here. Got a I always just wax too. rhapsodic about a uh, different species of sand wasp for a while. That's uh, always happy to do that. Let's see. I see Bill Murphy had written something in the chat. Um, I don't know if he's still on. Yeah, Bill's still there. If you want to ask your question, Bill, or just a comment, I think it looks like hoping that behavioral and genetic phylogenies would enhance each other. Yeah, I was too, but it was. Uh, the, the view I tried to take on that uh, was that even if the phylogenies were not necessarily uh, corresponding to each other, it was still telling me something about the, the signal that they contained, which was still uh, important for understanding the group. Uh, as for who I worked with at Bishop Museum, I did work closely with Neil. Uh, Jim Boone uh, was my predecessor as the collections manager uh, at Bishop. He was the one who uh, instigated and formulated the Hawaiian Cave Insect Collection Digitization Project. Uh, unfortunately, I never got the chance to meet him before he passed, but he did a fantastic job putting together uh, the groundwork for restoring the Hawaiian Cave uh, Arthropod Collection. So his work continues on. Yeah, he was at the Field Museum, which is only three hours from here. That's where I knew James. But the Bishop Museum is a, a real powerhouse for arthropod research. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, just surprising to since it's so remote from all these other places. I think the internet changed everything. <laughs> yeah, when I was uh, working at Bishop, we got people coming in, uh, not just from the mainland, but from overseas all the time. So that was, uh, it really is a fantastically active uh, collection out there. Can I squeeze in one more question? Are there any endemic um, Bembics that might be looked for in the Maryland, Delaware area? So there are Bembics that are out here. Off the top of my head, um, I think the species that are here are mostly pretty typical of the region. Uh, most of the diversity uh, in North America is centralized, uh, the unusual species uh, in the Southwest, so out in Arizona and Nevada. Uh, here would mostly be Bembix Americana and other members of uh, that group. But they're definitely uh, around and they're, even if the species themselves are not uh, unusual, getting the chance to uh, observe their behavior can be really exciting. So they're definitely mm -hmm. worth uh, taking a look for. Uh, they're very visible where they occur. They're noisy in flight and they're very large and attractively patterned. So they are uh, easy to keep an eye on, even if they're not necessarily easy to catch. They're fantastic flyers. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to sure. ask if um, the Bembics are vulnerable in the tunnels, like uh, it's just a sand or soil, if you will. And those tunnels could collapse, I would think, right, from time mm -hmm. to time. And are they able to get out if they, if the tunnel is collapsed? So, Once if, they, yeah. So, if the tunnel is collapsed, uh, they should be able to get out. They, they are really fantastic at digging, uh, and the when they emerge from their pupil shell, uh, the nest will be filled entirely. Uh, that's actually the last thing that the female wasp does before leaving the nest is that she'll backfill it completely. So the wow. uh, the freshly emerged wasp will have to dig its way out. And if uh, a nesting female wasp ends up getting buried, she should be able to dig her way out as well. Although interestingly, there aren't really that many reports of uh, Bembix nests uh, collapsing normally. They're pretty well constructed uh, for the soils that they're in to maintain their shape. So they could do it, uh, but luckily they don't uh, have to all that often. Although it would be interesting to look closer at the species that are nesting uh, where the tide line is and where the water is actually washing over them. Uh, that may have uh, more issues with collapsing. But they have to dig their way out when they emerge anyway. Mm -hmm. all, all these species do the same thing? Uh, as far as uh, as far as we know, they all uh, dig their way out. And the thing is that the males actually emerge a little bit before the females, and they're actually able to detect where the females are about to dig their way out of. So they'll uh, sort of congregate over uh, female nest emergence spots. Really? <laughs> yeah, how they do that uh, is not entirely understood, whether they're uh, picking up on the vibrations of the female digging from underground or whether it's some sort of uh, chemical signal but uh, they're able to figure out where the new females are about to come out of. Yeah, well, the males have to dig their way out as well, right? Mm -hmm. the so male, there must be, huh? The males actually do a little bit of digging uh, during the course of their daily activities. They dig sleeping burrows. So they don't dig a, a full nest, but they dig sort of a shorter version uh, to spend the night in. So they can oh. they can dig as well. They're not they're not as accomplished at it as the females are because they don't need to dig as deeply or as much, but they can dig. An entomological debutante's ball, eh? <laughs> Singles bar. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Go ahead. Jeremy, I have a but... Go ahead, Dave, you can go first. All right, thank you, Gene. Uh, Jeremy, this is this is pretty cool stuff. Do uh, the Bemex that feed on Diptera, are they strictly feeding on the adults or they go after the uh, larva occasionally as well? So they're entirely feeding on the adults and that's because they actually attack them uh, in the air. So they respond to the visual signal of seeing uh, something of the appropriate size flying and then they'll uh, grab it 
And they actually, uh, once they're in physical contact with it, uh, they'll assess whether it's the, the right kind of prey and then sting it. There's been some interesting studies done uh, where they've gotten Bembix wasps to uh, attack models uh, moving through the air in the way that a large fly might. And they'll go after them, but they won't do the follow-up sting. So it's sort of a, a two-pronged attack. Uh, but because of that, they're only attacking the adults uh, but the, one of the things that they do is that the females may actually uh, feed on the gut contents of the flies. Uh, they won't feed on the bodies of the fly themselves. They don't have the, uh, the mouth parts for that as adults. Uh, but they'll, uh, they'll stick their mouth parts uh, into the, uh, the gut chamber of the fly, and they'll drain out any fluid in there before using the, the fly as uh, food for the offspring. Uh, I think uh, the, one of the pictures I showed earlier, and I, I won't go through 70 slides to go back and find it, but the female wasp is actually draining out uh, the gut contents in that photo. So yeah, there's a couple different things that are going on during the, uh, the predation behavior. Is there any evidence that they use auditory cues or chemical cues, or is it strictly visual? So there is- For, for the hunting, I'm sorry. There is some evidence that they use chemical cues for that secondary part of the attack, where once they've grabbed it, they then assess whether they've grabbed the right thing. Uh, I don't know if any work has been done on their auditory cues, and that would be uh, interesting to look at. There's been quite a bit of work done on their visual acuity, uh, both because they're attacking uh, prey based on, at least partially based on visual sense, and because they're able to recognize their nesting site and return to it when they've been away on a provisioning trip. But I don't believe any research has been done on whether they use auditory cues, and that would be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Sure, Dave. All yours. I was, I was wondering about the uh, the nest, the tunnels and the nests, and uh, one, how deep are they, and how did you study the structures of these uh, nests and tunnels? So they vary in length from uh, around 15 centimeters to 45 centimeters down, sort of sloping into the earth. And the way that you uh, study these structures, uh, it's a bit tricky. You have to dig them out, uh, not digging the nest itself, but you want to use a trowel to dig next to the nest. And then you sort of break into it from the side. So you get uh, sort of a cross-section view. And that way you can view the nest structure uh, without collapsing it entirely. It's a lot easier said than done. I'm not all that good at it myself. You can also, uh, you can pour something down uh, the entrance of the nest, uh, a powder like a uh, talcum powder or the like, which helps you keep track of where the nest is actually going when you're breaking in from the side. But it is tricky to dig in the right way that you're actually getting the nest and you're not just collapsing the thing. The first nests I found uh, ended in collapse. So hopefully the uh, the larva was all right. Yeah, 45 centimeters, that's a pretty big hole you're digging there, isn't it? Yeah, and to, to some extent, the length uh, seems to be a, a factor of where the nest is. Uh, species that are digging... Uh, in dunes will be digging to different depths than ones that are digging in uh, firmer soil. Mm -hmm. So uh, sure. there's there's a lot that's been uh, written on their particular uh, microhabitat preferences. My other question was about the uh, purpose of the abdominal prongs. Yes. Uh, so the interesting thing about those abdominal prongs is even though they're so diverse and so intriguingly shaped, uh, we don't know what they're used for. Uh, when I was doing my research, I couldn't even find any speculation on what those are for. Uh, but they do occur only in males. Uh, so my best guess uh, as to what they're being used for is that they're probably used uh, in male-male competition. Uh, when uh, one of those uh, virgin females comes up out of the ground, often a whole bunch of males will swarm her, of course, and they'll form a, a mating ball until one of them can grab the female and fly away. And at first I wondered if the prong was somehow useful for keeping hold on the female, but there's no corresponding uh, niche uh, in the females into which this might fit. So my guess is that they're using those to try to dislodge other males in the mating ball. Uh, but that could be off. Uh, it's kind of hard to see what's going on in the middle of a mating ball. 
but uh, it's uh, as far as I can tell, uh, they haven't really been observed to use them for anything else. They certainly wouldn't play a role uh, in digging because the males do less digging than the females and the females have no corresponding structure. So that's, uh, that's the best I've got onto what those are for. Okay, thank you. Some of the um, ones that I've found were in a sand pile that was for construction, mm. and, you know, uh, utility work. Right behind the college where I teach here, yeah. uh, they had a big sand pile some time ago, and uh, uh, one of the groundskeepers knew that I'm into the entomology, and he had been digging, using some of the sand to do so, and he uncovered the pupil cases, and he brought them to me. So, fantastic! I reared them out. I have the, the adults now, and the and the pupil cases with them. So, I just wonder, is that like? Uh, not unusual to find them in, in sort of an artificial, if you will, kind of environment like that? Yeah, it depends on the species. There are some which are more tolerant of that sort of environment than others. They mm -hmm. do sometimes occur in construction piles, uh, sometimes in uh, sandboxes, which uh, mm -hmm. can stress some people out uh, along driveways. So Bembex americana in particular uh, is the most widespread species, and partially that's because it has uh, a much broader tolerance of environment than other species. So that's a species that you would find uh, frequently in environments like that, or some of the more specialized species like the coastal nesters or the dune nesters uh, probably wouldn't be found in those environments, uh, even given the opportunity. Anyone else have any questions or comments that they'd like to... Uh ask or say. So uh, one last thing. Uh, in Oregon, I've been in some of the big lava tubes. Have any studies been done that you know about in these other areas? Because we have quite a lot in the uh, West. There's lava tubes, not only in Oregon, but other states that have huge lava flow surfaces across their um, region. So uh, any work been done like that that you know of that compares to what they've done in Hawaii? So uh, I'm not aware off the top of my head of uh, where that research might have gone. I largely focused on uh, the Hawaiian tubes in particular, but I do know that the the work that had come out of the, uh, the Hawaiian cave arthropod collection uh, did lead to quite a bit of a reevaluation of other lava tubes in similar environments. So I would uh, expect there probably has been some similar work. Uh, what was found and when it was conducted and how much more there is still to find, uh, I'm not sure. But it, it was uh, particularly interesting uh, to me to see how a really unique environment in Hawaii uh, led to discoveries uh, in other places as well, like in the Australia story. How long were the bigger lava tubes in Hawaii that you know about? So I don't know the uh, the lengths uh, personally. I've mostly worked with the uh, the material, and I haven't done any of the uh, the spelunking myself. the uh, The Bembex tubes are about as uh, deep as I care to go. I'm not a <laughs> not a caver, right? Well, I just asked because the uh, there's one in Oregon. It's part of a national park uh, yeah. system. That, um, it's one mile long. Oh, yeah, it's huge, one mile, and of course, it's big and wide. So, uh, it's a favorite thing for people to do, and there's crowds of people walking through there. So, I don't know if it'd be very good for looking for stuff. It could be there might be stuff, but it is lengthy. I mean, one mile—that's pretty long lava tube. I thought, you know, mm. um, and there's other ones too besides that. Um, so, anyway, just wondering. Yeah, I don't know uh, the Hawaiian lava tube lengths, but I do know that they are quite a bit shorter than that. Some of them are mm -hmm. quite small. So it would be uh, an interesting comparison. Yeah. Okay, anybody else then? Uh, if not, we'll say thank you very much to Dr. Jeremy Frank for 
presenting for us tonight and appreciate your time. And My pleasure. Nice uh, presentation, great pictures and videos. Appreciate that a lot. Very nicely done. Thank you. So anyway, yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Frank. It's good Thank to hear you. it. Good, good to hear your talk. All right. And I'll be emailing you and getting your contact information. And you'll get the monthly newsletter, the e-newsletter, as well as the journals. Looking forward to it. You have some thank yous in the chat box from my students. Just thanking oh. you as well. So. Thank you for coming. I hope they yeah, learned this is some a things. Great group to work on if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. I think for my students, I'd venture to say that this was part of a pretty unique sort of thing for them. They probably wonder, why do people do this, right, guys? <laughs> say, who does this to study bugs like this? Or, <laughs> um, And I try to explain, you know, because it's, yeah, it's different for folks that haven't heard much about it, you know, so. Um, but they're saying, thank you. Lovely presentation. Learned a lot. Okay, great. Nice presentation. Thank you, students, for joining us. And, Appreciate your comments also. And I'll see you guys back at the homestead, right? Back on in the lab next week. So have a good weekend and study for your exam. Those are my lecture. <laughs> All right. So um, the MES folks are going to um, continue 